we are seeing near record levels of puts being open. If we take a look at the put volume and open interest, you could see that if we look at something like the NASDAQ, we are at a put to call ratio of two. If you look at something like the SPY, we are at a pull put to call ratio of 2.4. However, I want you to see what happens when we filter this by large orders. That means a million plus. The put call ratio suddenly goes up and you see these insane numbers of puts being opened here. 17 million, 20 million, 2.3 million, 4.3 million, same thing for the NASDAQ. So in this video, we're going to get into what this means, why there are a ton of bearish options open and does the chart actually corroborate this? Are these actual bets that the market is going to go down? Are they hedges? Are people closing or institutions closing their puts? We're also go going to get into what to look out for in terms of the charts and macroeconomic events. Welcome back to the Traveling Trader. This week's edition of TA Thursday, a series that you guys know and love. If you guys are not subscribed to the channel, but you continue to watch this, go ahead and click that subscribe button. Do the channel a favor, click that subscribe button so you don't miss an update. Let's get right into it. Now, before I get into the options, I want to take a look at the macro chart here, the weekly chart for the triple Qs. I posted this on Twitter, by the way, follow me on Twitter and Instagram. I do free finance content each and every day. You definitely don't want to miss it. So for the days I don't post here, I post there. But I said that we haven't been below the 200 week moving average on the NASDAQ. This is the weekly chart since, yes, you're not misreading this, 2009. So 13 years we have not been below the 200 week moving average on the NASDAQ. This is why I was comfortable selling puts here as well on some other names as well. I'm not saying we're not going to drop further, but if in 13 years, we haven't breached the 200 week moving average. Even if you were a novice at technical analysis, that has to draw your attention to the possibility that this might be a good price level to get into where we are 35% down from highs. And anytime you are 35% down from highs on the NASDAQ and you bought, if your long term horizon is truly long term, you are going to come up big time. And I did this video before talking about how long does it take to make your money back in a bear market. And yes, if all you did in some of the major crashes that we've had in history, if all you did was, you know, basically buy at the top, wait and not do anything during the bear market and wait to see how long you're going to get back to profitable, yes, it's going to take you two to three years. However, if you buy as soon as we hit a bear market, especially on major levels like this, it usually takes a year or less before you're profitable. So, and on the S&P 500, we are also at the 200 week moving average. We did breach this back in the COVID crash of 2020. However, there is a similar track record where aside from that, we haven't been below the 200 week moving average on the S&P since 2010, aside from the violent COVID crash drop of March 2020. The SPY is something I also sold cash secure puts on. And by the way, if you want access to all of our trades, we are running out of spots actually relatively early. It's October 5th as of the time of this recording, October 6th. And we are running out of spots during the first week of the month already. So book a call, book a free call with one of our ambassadors. You get access to the alerts, the chats, the Zoom calls with me. We just did a banging Zoom call last Sunday where we went over day trades, charts, how to trade futures, how to trade options. You get access to the courses, the day trading course, the options course, and obviously the chat where 24-7 we are talking about stocks, options, futures, long-term buys day trades all day, every day. So sign up, link is in the description below. All right. So aside from that, what else are we looking at? Well, one of the reasons that I was comfortable selling puts there, not only because I'm okay owning the SPY and the triple Qs at a discount, I think my cost basis on the SPY would be below the pre-COVID high and on the triple Qs, same thing. But also I had pointed out in one of my last TA sessions that there were a lot of oversold indicators, including the McClellan oscillator ratio adjusted the lowest that we've seen since the COVID crash. And certainly these two are the lowest two that we've seen in the last five years, the lowest two readings. When this is low, then the market is severely oversold. Also the put call ratio 
on September 23rd hit over one. And when we hit over one on the put call ratio, that usually means that the market is majorly oversold and due for a bounce. So that brings me to my next data point. Looking at the put call ratio here for the SPY and the triple Qs, there are some big bets being made here that the market is going to go down. And these are, all of these are, let me pull out my trusty mouse tool. If you look at this, a lot of these are super in the money. These are not out of the money retail bets. These are institutions putting up these kinds of premiums here. Now, what I did notice is there is a major discrepancy between open interest and volume. So that tells me one of two, no, well, that tells me two things. Um, two things could po possibly be true here. One, uh, either, either, either or both could be possibly true. One is that a lot of these are closed orders because open interest tells you how many contracts are currently open. Volume tells you how many were currently traded for the day, right? So if open interest is low and we had this much volume, then that usually means that either these were closes or these contracts were traded in and out all day. And these are the contracts that are left open because when you open and close a put, open and close a put, open and close a put, each one of those transactions counts against the volume category, but the open interest only counts what is open, what is left open at the end of the day. So a lot of these could be sells and or day trades, right? However, you can't ignore the fact that the put call ratio is still very high when you d sort by premium. I sorted by premium of a million dollars or more. So still, regardless of which way you cut it, there are some heavy puts coming in on the SPY and the NASDAQ. Now, why is that? It's because there's major uncertainty. So the jobless claims came out last week and showed that jobless numbers hit a five month low. This is bad for the market. Remember, the Fed wants to see unemployment go up. It's unfortunate, but it's true. And as long as unemployment goes down or there's indications that unemployment is going to go down, that means the Fed is going to continue to hike aggressively because they're trying to push unemployment up. They're trying to push inflation down. When unemployment is severely down, that means that there are a lot of people still with spending power that will continue driving the inflation. So the jobless numbers came out showing that jobless claims hit a five-month low. However, yesterday, U.S. job openings show a drop to 10 million, the lowest since June. This is what essentially propelled or one of the reasons why the market propelled, right, is because job, uh, job openings, there's actually less of them, even though this is a very high number still. Um, now we get the official unemployment reading on Friday, October 7th. This is important because the minute that you start seeing unemployment tick up, if we look at this chart, that is the likeliest time that we are on the brink of a major recession. Now, obviously, a lot of people argue that we are in a technical rece recession because we got two back-to-back -back quarters of negative GDP, but a real broad-based recession happens when unemployment starts ticking up. So if unemployment, which is expected to be unchanged at 3.7, and that comes out Friday, October 7th, if unemployment goes up, then all of a sudden we are looking at a, you know, a potential broad-based recession happening sooner rather than later. Also, the price of oil is skyrocketing. My last video, I just did a video totally on the oil category, right? And why the price of oil is going up, why we actually played XLE here at support, and we're up 14% on this stock in a week. We're up on our Occidental calls as well, our call spread. But this shows that before a recession, we usually get a spike in oil, which is very likely to happen before end of year, the way things are trending. And then obviously next week, October 13th, we have CPI data coming out. So here's the deal. If unemployment comes in higher than expected, and if CPI comes in lower than expected, then I think the market will continue to rally to at least FOMC. And at that point, if both of those things are true, right, if unemployment is higher than expected, meaning it's going up, even though it seems counterintuitive, and the CPI comes in lower than expected, 
then we will likely get another rally in the markets because that means that what the Fed has already done is working, or at least that will be the perception and that the Fed won't be as aggressive November 2nd, right? Because if if those two things happen, then the Fed cannot, in my mind, justify a 75 basis point rate hike. They're either going to do something low, like 50 or 25, or they will just pause and wait until the next FOMC meeting to see what to do. And that will continue to rally the markets, in my view. Now, in terms of where we can get to, I mean, it'll be a bear market rally for sure. I don't think the bear market can be over while the Fed is still hiking because that's never happened in history. The Fed has to stop hiking for the bear market to be over. So as long as the Fed continues to hike uh, and continues the rate hiking cycle, then I do think that you know the market will experience the, these bear market rallies followed by new lows, right? And I'm targeting... As you guys know, if you're fans of this channel, the pre-COVID highs on the S&P and on the NASDAQ. The pre-COVID highs on the S&P, on the SPY at least, is around 340, which I think would be 3300 and change on the actual S&P index. If we take a look at the dollar, the UK intelligently reversed their tax cuts which had increased the value of the UK pound or sorry, the British pound, which is the reason that the, the US dollar is now tanking. Now the US dollar, it can continue to tank. And I'll be interested to see what happens when the Dixie hits the support at around 108 and a half, a, a trend line that it has actually kept for what, seven months now since February, 2022, eight months. So I'll be very curious to see what happens when it gets to this trend line, which will also be the area of the golden pocket, the golden pocket created by the Fibonacci numbers 0.618 and 0.65. I'll be very curious to see what happens here. I might actually long the dollar from, from that area as well. It depends on what's going on at the time. And aside from the Fed hiking, as I said before, we haven't even seen what earnings are like. Remember, if you take a look at the at the mega cap stocks, their earnings come out October, end of October and November. So Apple reports October 27th. We have Tesla reporting on October 19th. We have Microsoft, uh, that's not Microsoft. <laughs> we have Microsoft reporting on October 26th. We have Amazon reporting on, you get the picture, uh, October 27th. So we haven't even seen that yet. And the next shooter drop according to a lot of finance experts, economists, analysts, the last shoe to drop would be earnings compression. We've seen valuation compression, right? Where companies valuations are getting hammered. We haven't really seen earnings and earnings guidance that are directly and severely affected by the inflation picture. So I'll be very curious to see what 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 happens there. But if unemployment comes in higher than expected, CPI comes in lower than expected, then I think at least until the earnings cycle, we will see a bear market rally. And that is why when I look at these puts, if you look at the dates, they're not puts that expire soon. A lot of them are December. A lot of them are next year because institutions are actually betting on that earnings compression, right? And that won't happen until earnings are released. It won't happen until the election is over. Um, and, you know, between now and then, we could get bear market rallies. So they're hedging themselves properly here by going deep in the money and far out in terms of expiration. These aren't things that expire next week, right? So these are true hedges. And the size here, you could tell that, the you know, this isn't your grandmother and grandfather hedging their portfolios. These are institutions here, 17 million, 21 million, 2 million, 4 million, 6 million, 8 million, 2 million, 15 million, et cetera. And I pulled this out because I was showing you what the forward price earnings looks like right now for stocks. We're currently hovering around 15 to 16, which is average, but usually in a bear market, we don't, uh, end the bear market until we get into that, you know, 12 to 14 range, which would be the case if we do get that earnings compression. And what I'd be looking to do is I hope we do get a rally to at least 390 on the SPY and on the triple Qs, that would be equivalent to, you know, around 
297 ish because that would make it a lot easier position to short from if I was to take a short. Again, it depends on what's going on. But if you're part of the academy, you'll know right away what I'm doing. But it will be a lot easier to short from those levels than to try to short from here the 200 week moving average where usually that is the killer of of all bear markets, right? And if we do a little bit of TA, a little more TA on the indices, you'll see that if we drew out the support and resistance lines, that this right here is the support line. It's clearly creating a wedge here, right? And this is the, or sorry, that was the resistance line. This is the support line. It's clearly creating a violent downward wedge. And the level that I was talking about uh, would coincide, you know, that 297, 300 level on the triple Qs. That would coincide as a potential area to short from. And, you know, if we don't break that trend, if we don't break that, you know, that, that, that wedge and the resistance line of that wedge, then it is an optimal short, uh, at least to hedge with a stop limit above that, right? So, you know, if we do bounce to this level as well, you know, we'd be somewhere around the 400 level on the S&P 500. And if we don't go above that, um, then that is potentially a good area to hedge. If we, you know, if you do take the short from, from resistance, then you'll definitely want to set a stop limit above here. One other thing to watch out for is this 10 year and three month uh, we are declining in terms of the yield curve. We are declining once again. But once this inverts, then we will be as close as ever to an actual broad-based recession here, right? So we are declining again. This is the inversion between the 10-year and the 3-month, where the 3-month will actually pay you more than the 10-year, which is crazy to think. But these inversions do happen uh, you know, during recessions and during dislocations in, in the market. So the minute that this gets negative, we've already seen the 10 year and two year invert many times, but the 10 year and three month is usually the death knell. And here's one other thing to consider that when January through September are is a down period, right? Usually, there's only about a 50-50 chance that October through December is going to be an up period. However, during midterm years, like the one we are in now, there's an 80% likelihood or an 80% uh, occurrence rate of a up market in October through December. So this makes sense to me that, you know, if unemployment is high, CPI is low, Fed pauses, on November, the election is over. It makes sense to me that we see, you know, a rally, um, maybe not all throughout that time, but at least until earnings. And if earnings show that there is significant compression, then that will likely be the next leg down. So these things are delicate. They are ever changing. Um, I am keeping this main pattern up, right? This, this descending wedge on both the S&P and the NASDAQ. I will be looking to see what happens once we get to resistance. This will likely be the, the point at which I'm willing to short optimally. For those of you that follow this channel know that we did actually short and closed our shorts on this rally here. Didn't end up shorting again. In hindsight, that would have been good at the break of, of the bear flag, but we didn't do that. And once I missed it, it was too non-optimal to short, right? And I definitely never, never, never short at support. So you know, especially not the 200 week moving average. So the next time that I'll short is likely if we get to the resistance here. And I think we will get there if what I said needs to happen happens. But long term, I'm still targeting the pre COVID highs. I mean, even if if you if you're not familiar with TA for the simple reason that if you look at this, right, the pre COVID highs, if you say that all of this run up here, all of this was due to Fed easy policy. And during the weird time that COVID was where people were sitting at home, but had a lot of money and were buying so many things. If, if, you know, you're saying to yourself that all of this factors that in, well, what happens now when the Fed is no longer easy and when they're taking liquidity out of the system, it does make sense that all of these valuations and earnings go back to a period where that stuff didn't exist right? At least, at least. So, you know, even if you're not familiar with TA, just think about it logically. So I, I do think that if earnings compression is actually a thing that we get there. Now, miraculously, 
you know, companies like like Apple, Microsoft can come out and say, what earnings compression? What are you talking about? Things are going swell. Uh, they've never been better, right? In which case, you're likely not going to get that earnings compression. You will get it from maybe some of the mid caps or some of the, the large caps in different industries, but not the, you might not get it from, I'm not saying you won't, but it is possible that if Apple, Microsoft, those big companies, Tesla come through and say, we're not experiencing earnings compression or even a lowered guidance, then the market won't be rattled by that on the contrary, right? So anyway, that is this edition of TA Thursday. Hopefully you got something out of it. Again, spots are going up really fast for October. So if you want our options plays, futures, etc., link is in the description below. Sign up and join the Academy or apply to join the Academy. Talk to one of our ambassadors. Leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think about all of these shorts, all of these puts. Is this alarming to you? Is this expected? Uh, do you expect the market to go down? Do you expect it to go up in the short term? Why? Let me know. Uh, hit that thumbs up. Stay safe out there, traders. Peace.